might seem to be a strange place to look for an Easter sermon. Uh, I do not urge this on the inexperienced preachers among us. Uh, but I want to look in Acts chapter 17, commencing in verse number 22 through verse 31. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse number 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. But as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and men, man's device. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Verse 31 reads, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand for them. I want to talk to us this morning about the other side of Easter. The other side of Easter. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. The other side of Easter, it's not about baskets and bunnies lilac and lilies is about the glorious fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. Good Friday, the crucifixion is the greatest proof, the greatest demonstration of the love of God. But Easter morning, resurrection, is the greatest demonstration of the power of God. He died on Friday. And he stayed dead all Friday night and all Saturday. But early Sunday morning, God raised them from the dead. The resurrection is indeed an historical fact. Jesus 
actually, for real, got up from the dead. He left his grave clothes in the cemetery because he was only borrowing the grave for the weekend. Uh, he left his grave clothes, he got up from the grave, he commissioned his disciples, he's conquered his tomb, he's defeated Satan, sin is dead, heaven is delivered, and some 60 years are now passed since the resurrection. And there is this Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, a young Pharisee by the name of Saul. He has persecuted certain of the church and with letters of authority to bring them bound back to Jerusalem. But on his way to Damascus, he is arrested by God himself. And God says, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. It's really not difficult for me to get my hands on you if I really want to have you. And he says, what will you have me to do? He says, go where you started. There's a man on Straight Street. I like that. On Straight Street. Who will tell you what I want you to do. And he goes to the home of Ananias and he receives the Holy Spirit. And Paul, who was a persecutor of the church, is now a preacher of the Lord's gospel. Uh, the church is scared to take him in. But Barnabas goes to sit with him on the back row. And Barnabas comes back and tells the elders, let's not be afraid to take him in because he's no longer persecuting Saul. He's praying Paul. He's no longer a student of Gamaliel. He's a servant of the Lord. And he is the gospel preacher to the Gentiles. And Paul is commissioned to bring the word of God to those who are outside Judaism. And Paul, on one of his journeys, finds himself in Athens at Mars Hill. Uh, Mars Hill is where the Areopagites meet to daily discuss some new idea. Uh, the Athenians, the Greeks, are lovers of philosophy. They love wisdom. They love ideas. As a matter of fact, the word philosophy, philosophia, phila meanings love of, sophia, wisdom, the love of wisdom, philosophy. The Athenians, the Greeks, were always interested in some new philosophy. Uh, the Epicureans, the Stoics, uh, the cynics were all gathered at the Areopagus, all of them there on Mars Hill to hear some new idea. And so Paul wanders into their midst by the power of God, and while walking around, he notices that they have thousands upon thousands of altars to gods, small g. They're interested in Epicurean philosophy, uh, in Stoic philosophy. They are interested in the philosophy of the cynics. They are interested in every, every, every facet of philosophy. And not to offend any god, they make thousands of altars to gods of every stripe. Fertility gods, sun gods, moon gods, native gods. Gods that they don't even know anything about. And so, not to offend any God, of the thousands of gods that they are worshiping, they build an altar to a God just in case they miss one. And they build an altar to this unknown God. From the reading of the text, it appears that this altar to the unknown God is hidden in a corner somewhere. Oh, it's, it's hidden, it's out of public sight. It's out of view. Large letters, large writing to the unknown God. But it, it must be hidden because Paul says, while well, walking around, I found it. Oh, it, it. It's right here in the text. 
Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar. Uh, it was hidden behind perhaps the altar to Zeus. Uh, perhaps it was hidden behind the altar to Jupiter, uh, the Greek gods, the Zeus, the father of all gods. So not to miss any god, Paul said, I notice that you are very superstitious. Uh, that word superstitious does not mean a black cat and uh, uh, it, it does not mean uh, throwing salt behind your back after you salt your food and, and uh, don't let nobody sweep on your foot because you're going to go to jail. That's, that's, that's some Louisiana kind of stuff. Uh, that's Algiers and New Orleans kind of superstition. I, that's not what I'm talking about. The word superstition in the text means I perceive that you are very religious. Very religious. I need to spend a minute there. You are very religious. And some of us here at Lily Grove are very religious. You sit in the same seat religiously. Talk back to me if you can. You drink coffee every day religiously. They already know what you want when you drive up at Starbucks. Because you get the same thing every day, religiously. You drive the same route to work. Talk back to me if you can. Your pattern never changes. You would be easy to assassinate because you do the same thing, religiously. You take the same route to church every Sunday, religiously. You clap when everybody else claps religiously. You sing because everybody else is singing religiously. I notice that many of you are very religious. But salvation is not about religion. Because if religion was a thing that money could buy, the rich would live and the poor would die. Salvation is not about religion. It's about a relationship. And if you don't have a relationship, I don't care how religious you are, you on your way to hell. I perceive that you are very superstitious. You are very religious. And I notice in your devotions that you have altars to all of these gods and, and tucked around the corner behind Zeus or Jupiter's altar, there's an altar that you, that you stuck back there to the unknown God. That's the one I want to point out to you today. That's the God I want to talk to you about today. And Lily Grove, that's the God that I want to raise up for us this morning. I, I know you know him. I, I know you heard about him. I, I know you're acquainted with him. But, but indulge me for a moment because that's quite a ways from Calvary's Hill to Mars Hill. Well, that's quite a ways from the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to these people who are in love with philosophy. And, and they're no different from us. We're in love with our devices. Uh, we're in love with our social media posts. Uh, we're in love with our, with our texts and our, and our pads and, and our e-books and, and, and our PayPal. And, and everything we have is for instant gratification. Everything we have, everything that surrounds us is to make life easy. Microwave this, instant that. Uh, you, you don't even go to the grocery store now. Uh, they bring you food to the house. Uh, Amazon makes it easy for you. Then in, if you go to the store, you park in the section where they bring your groceries out and put them in the car for you because everything has to be easy. 
Nobody stands in the line at the ticket counter at the movies. Your ticket is on your phone. Just, just show them that. And, and, and you even got your seat on your phone and all of that kind of stuff to make life easy and look like life ought to be better since we have all of these things to make life uncomplicated. But they still sell Xanax and Zoloft. You need medicine to sleep and medicine to wake up. I thought life was supposed to be easy. There's a long way from Calvary's Hill to Mars Hill. Walk with me around the text. This God, this unknown God, that, that Paul introduces to these Athenian Areopagites. This unknown God is sovereign in creation. He is sovereign in creation. Uh, it, it's right here in the text. God that made the world and all things therein. This God that we serve is too big to be called a man of staff. He's too big to be called a higher power. He's too big to use the Star, World, Star Wars parlance of him as the force. Uh, God is more than some force. He's more than some higher power. Donald Trump is a higher power. God is not the man upstairs. I wouldn't go to bed tonight if that was a man upstairs. He made the heavens and the earth and all that is therein. As a matter of fact, the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord. I wish I had a Bible reader. The fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he had founded it upon the seas. Come on, you can say it with me. And established it upon the flood. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in the holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart will not lift it up his soul unto vanity or sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek your face, O Jacob. Lift up your head. O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in the battle. He's not some man upstairs. He's not some higher power. He's not the force. He's the Lord, strong and mighty he made heaven and earth and he cannot be worshipped by man's hand watch this as though he needed anything I, I mean come on come on for real what, what can you render unto God for all of his benefits? Somebody ought to help me preach it. How can you pay God for a sunrise? How much does keeping you all night cost? What can you give God for waking you up this morning? much do you owe God for keeping your children? What can you give God for blessing you with health and strength? The only thing you can give God is praise. He don't need your money because all the gold is here. All the silver is his. Come on, talk back to me here. The cattle on a thousand hills and the hills that the cattle are on belong to him. What can I render for all these benefits? How much would you pay 
to keep your heart beating all night without you even being aware of it. God kept your lungs expanding and constricting with your autonomic nervous system that you don't even think about. How many times a day do you blink your eyes without even thinking about it? How many times does your brain tell your hand to move automatically without you even thinking about it? You don't have any monetary gift that you can give God for that. How much would you pay not to go to hell? How much do I owe God? I owe God everything. I can't thank him enough. I can't praise him enough. I can't holler enough. I can't raise my hands enough. How much do I owe God for a good mother and father? How much do I owe God for my old preacher who told me he died one Friday? But he got up early one Sunday morning. How much do you owe God for a good wife? For a good husband? How much can you pay God for salvation? Yeah. Well, how much does heaven cost? Streets paved with gold. Walls of jasper. Gates of pearls. Then every child of God got a room. In my father's house. Many mansions. How much do I owe God? What can I render? What, what can I give God as if he needs anything? He doesn't need anything, but he wants something. Somebody ought to help me shout here. He does not need anything, but he wants something. He wants me to acknowledge his goodness. He wants me to shout aloud of his mercy. He wants me to give him my best praise with my Easter clothes on. He wants me to mess my makeup up, sweat my clothes out, shout with my best hallelujah, cause this might be my last time. And hear me brothers and sisters, if you don't praise him, rocks will cry out. I don't want no rock crying in my place because he woke me up this morning. Put shoes on my feet, money in my pocket, clothes on my back. Thank you. Hallelujah. In him, in him, we live and move and have our being. That's, that's sovereign in creation. In him, we live, move, have our being. In him in him in him in him in can serve as a noun as a preposition as an adverb I don't even know what the function is in this sentence I just know I'm in him. 
That's where joy comes. That's where peace comes from. That's where my hope lies. I live and move and have my being in him. Let me, let me, let me, let me show you how that verse all read. For in him we live and move and have our being. Since he is I am, we are. And the only way we can are, he got to am. I, I know it's bad English. I know. I know some of you school teachers and educators gonna criticize me, but I ah, cause he am. I'm, I'm just in him. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I walk with him. I talk with him. I live with him. Him dwells in me. Have I got a witness? Now I'm to him. Who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. We can even ask our thing now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. For in him we live, we move, we have our being. He is sovereign in creation. He transcends time. He's outside space. He has no beginning, no ending. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He doesn't see past, present, present and future. He sees it all in one fell swoop. He stands outside time and he sees everything that's in motion. And when he feels like it, he just steps in time and works something out for you. He's outside time, but when you get in a situation, he'll step in your circumstance and block whatever it is the devil is trying to send your way and then go back to where he was and he's still with you. In him, we live, we move, and have our being. He can answer a prayer in Clear Lake and sit up with me here on Till Western and go talk with you in Missouri City and never leave heaven. Because he just transcends. He's just bigger than anything we can ever imagine. So that's why I, 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 because he am. I live in him. I move in him. I have my being in him. Sovereign in creation. But as I hurry, the scripture also tells us that he is Supernatural in incarnation. Supernatural in incarnation. The Godhead, brothers and sisters, cannot be gold or silver or stone or graven by art or man's device. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. God winking at it does not mean that God does not have an approbation against it. God winking at it does not mean that God just nods and approves and moves on. That, that, that verse means that in the time of man's ignorance, God in mercy overlooked it. But now that Jesus has come, there is appointed a day where everybody will be judged by the man he has appointed. 
The Hebrew says, in sundry time. I wish I had a Bible reader. And in diverse places, God spoke through prophets and, and men of old. But now, God speaks through a son. Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. God no longer winks at ignorance. Because that's too much for you to be exposed to, to be ignorant. I would not have you, the scripture says, to be ignorant. You're ignorant? Go to Sunday school. You're ignorant of the things of God? Read the Bible. You're ignorant? Come listen to preaching. And listen, ignorant does not mean you're stupid. Ignorance means that you're not in the knowledge of. Because all of us are ignorant of something. If you don't embalm bodies for a living, you're ignorant of mortuary science. If you don't operate in the operating room, you are ignorant of how to do surgery. If you're not an anesthesiologist, you are ignorant of how to put somebody to sleep. That, that doesn't mean you're stupid. That doesn't mean you don't have good sense. That means that's not your area of expertise. That's what ignorance means. It means you're just not in the knowledge of. And if you're not in the knowledge of God, he has sent somebody to make him comprehensible. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give this to you. And, and I'm not going to charge you this. I'm going to give you this for free. Jesus is God at eye level. Not, not, not way up there. God knew that we couldn't understand him way up there. So he had to come to eye level. Eye level. So I could understand him on my level. Now I will never be on his level. So he came to be on my level. Yet without sin. He came to make God comprehensible. He came to make God understandable. He came to put God on the shelf where we could reach him. Jesus is Holy Spirit with dust painted on it. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's God that we can put our hands on, but our hands on him does not make him God. Because he was God in eternity past. And when he came to the earth, he did not become, in being Jesus, he did not become God Jr., He's God, very God. He's 100% God. But he lays aside his authority. He lays aside his, 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 his priorities as God. And he puts them aside to be subject to the Father's will. That's, that's, that's the hypostatic union. He's God and man. All God, all man. He lowers himself. Uh, the self-emptying, the kenosis doctrine of, of, of the incarnation. He, he lowers himself to become like one of us. He becomes what we are that we might become what he is. He's sovereign in creation. He is, he is supernatural in incarnation. But finally, he's supreme in resurrection. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. You're not going to be judged on your religion. Being Baptist ain't going to save you. I don't care what the Church of God in Christ say. Being Church of God in Christ ain't going to save you. The Catholics got a problem with anybody who ain't Catholic, but being Catholic is not going to save you. Because all of the aforementioned are a religion. We are members of the Baptist denomination. But denomination will not save you. 
because there will not be a section in heaven roped off for Baptists. And the Methodists will be upstairs and the Episcopalians will be uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the other room uh, and the Church of God in Christ will be in the overflow and we Baptists going to have first priority. No, we are not saved because of a religion. The only thing that saves is a relationship. You're not going to be judged on what you wear, where you live, what you drive, or how much you make. You'll not be judged on the hue of your skin or the texture of your hair. You will not be judged on who your mama or your daddy was. <laughs> because all of those things are externals that have nothing to do with salvation. He said, that's coming a day. On the other side of Easter, there's coming a day where the world will be judged in righteousness by the man that God has already appointed. You're going to help me close this, won't you? He has given assurance to all men that he raised them from the dead. You hear me, brothers and sisters? You didn't wake up early this morning to serve a dead Jesus. No, no, six, six o'clock in the morning is, is too early to be up in church. Some of you falling asleep right now. I see your eyes about to close. This is too early for you to be up talking about you just come to hear the choir sing. It's too early to get up to talk about you want to hear some man preach. No, I hope what motivated you to get up this morning it's because he got up one morning. I wish I had somebody to help me here. I'm glad this morning I got a relationship. I thank God he was sovereignly in creation. I thank God he was supernatural in incarnation. But I thank God he's supreme in resurrection. In other words, his resurrection predates my resurrection. Because Jesus got up from the grave, one day I am going to get up from the grave. Is there anybody here have a relationship? You walk with Jesus in the morning. You talk with Jesus whenever you feel like it. Jesus is your friend when all your friends are gone. Is there anybody here got a relationship with Jesus that when trouble rise you hasten to his throne when your children get in trouble you can call the name of Jesus when your body is failing you can call the name of Jesus when you don't know which way to turn you can call the name of Jesus when it gets dark in your life you can call the name of Jesus. I feel like calling him right now. Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. Is there anybody here feel like helping me call that name? Jesus, Adam's redeemer, Abel's vindicator, Abraham's sacrifice. Noah's ark Moses push on fire Jesus a rock in a weary land a shelter in a time of storm a way out of no way is there anybody here ever tried my Jesus if you got a relationship with him and you don't mind testifying if he brought you out and you don't care who's looking at you if he made a way and you don't mind being a witness if he pick you up turn you around place your feet on solid ground why don't you grab somebody shake somebody's hand tell him i serve a risen savior he's in the world today i know that he is living whatever men may say 
I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always me. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how? I know he lives. He lives in my heart. He lives in my heart. Have you tried it? And he always and he's all right. I know he's all right. From the grave, he arose with a mighty power over his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose and because he's supreme in resurrection one of these days you're going to pick up the chronicle and read in the obituary column that Terry Anderson is dead but that'll be a misprint because I'll be more alive then than I've ever been before and they will take this lifeless body out to the cemetery and my favorite preacher will stand over my grave and say, For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God in his wise providence to take out of this world the soul of this our deceased brother, we do hereby commit this clay tabernacle to its kindred elements, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust, looking for him in the general resurrection at the last day. One day the trump of God shall sound, and those who sleep in him shall be changed and made like unto his own glorious body. And those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. 